The plastic bag we pulled from the viscous mixture of blood and ash had contained two things, a photograph and a folded piece of paper. We placed each on a side table in the parlor and gathered around to examine our findings. The photograph sent a cold shiver down my spine. Despite the fact that I couldn't tell exactly what the image was, it was some sort of entrance. At first I thought it was the stairs leading down into some crude basement. So dark was the center of the hallway. But once I spotted the dirt and the dust on the margins of the picture, I thought perhaps the mine shaft. I glanced as inconspicuously as I could at the faces peering over the photograph and was somewhat disappointed and simultaneously relieved. I didn't see anything resembling recognition or self-satisfaction, two things I might expect from the creator of the jar. Everyone's expression seemed pretty much matched up to the one that I imagined graced my face, a look of cluelessness and uneasiness. Except, of course, for Graham. Graham Willoughby's face had drained of all its color, and his lower lip trembled. Whatever this doorway was, he knew it well, and it frightened him to his very core. What is this? William Pettigrew finally asked. He gave a tentative side glance to the shaken man. Graham? Read the paper, Graham replied, in a hoarse voice barely above a whisper. It was as if he couldn't tear his eyes from the photograph on the table, not even to read the words that came with it. As William unfolded the paper, something fell out and quickly fluttered to the ground. He picked it up and held it out for us to see. It was a small, red envelope about the size of a business card. He set it to the side and held the paper up to his face. He cleared his throat. Graham Willoughby, confess your sins. After your confession, open the envelope. Accept your punishment. We waited in anxious silence, watching the mustached man. Beads of sweat were rising like dew across his creased forehead. He said nothing, only stared deeper and deeper into the photograph. The emptiness of the entryway reflected back and hollow in his pupils. I can't. Although I had only heard his voice full of nothing but confidence and assuredness, this phrase parted from his lips with a whimper. It was the sound of defeat. You have to, Greta said this with as much less empathy than what the situation called for. Oh, well, we're all going to end up like that, she added, pointing to the shriveled body of Lucas Hannigan, the one that still lay in the sarcophagus. Ander winced. Graham raised his eyes to the tomb, but quickly brought them back down to the photograph. He took a deep breath. As you know, I was Regis's business partner. He researched ancient cultures, civilizations. I'd, I'd help him organize archaeological digs at locations his data led us to. I looked to the photograph again, and I could see it now. Not a mine shaft, but the entrance to an underground dig site. It was somewhere close to uh, Abedos, in Egypt, about f 15 years ago. Regis had found evidence that suggested of another ancient city somewhere close by, so I, I, I secured him the logical things he would need to sponsor a dig. I got a, a group of archaeologists, kids from a university and their professors looking to get their hands dirty at a, at a real site. I got, I got other things ready, too, he hesitated, including equipment. He was obviously getting more agitated. He used one hand to wipe the excess sweat from his upper lip, and used his other to trace the outline of the dig entrance on the photo. I had gotten a tip on some less expensive bracers. The things they used to keep tunnels supported during underground digs. He clarified. I had used the same supplier for years. I thought I could save some money and... He trailed off. Started shaking his head. They had some success at the site. And they wanted permission to dig deeper. 
The bracers were new. I only meant to try them out for an upper-level dig, but the more they find, the better for me, so... They were about 70 feet down when the tunnel collapsed. I could see his eyes glaze over as he stared transfixed at the photograph. Cheap bracers. Uh, the cheap bracers I bought, they, f they failed. The whole thing came crumbling down, one fall triggering the next. It took a few weeks to dig back down to them, but by then... He closed his eyes. Everyone was already dead, crushed by the rocks. They died immediately. No one said anything. Not that I blame them. What could you say to something like that? Instead, William solemnly offered the small red envelope. Graham took it. We watched as he tore it open with shaky hands. His eyes moved right to left only once. There was a moment of confusion as though he hadn't quite understood what he read, then comprehension dawned and the reaction was immediate. His skin turned even paler and his breath stopped short in his throat. He very slowly placed the paper inside on the table next to the photo. It read... When buried deep within the darkness, consume more air to stay alive. Again, I monitored the expressions of the people around me to see if this meant more to them than it did to me. This time, one other person besides Graham seemed different. William Pettigrew. His face was one of solemn pity mixed with disgust. He looked at Graham, who was still staring, dumbstruck, the cryptic message he had just unveiled. Graham, are you sure you've told us everything? The other man shuddered and turned his face partially away from the group. He looked at the sarcophagus as though contemplating whether ending up like Adler's father was a better fate than whatever the envelope's message entailed for him. And then he spoke. Like I said, it took about three weeks to get down there. The excavators were. I mean, most of them were crushed as soon as the tunnel collapsed. He hesitated. Uh, there was... There was a small group that survived down there. A handful of the students survived around... Around two weeks. The recovery team could see that much, but he paused, and my pounding heartbeat filled his silence. They. they had eaten the dead. The reaction from the audience was noticeable. Fawn and Forrest both leaned slightly away from him in unison. Greta turned her head away, as though she had smelled something foul. Anders' hand framed his forehead as he began to nervously rock back and forth. Graham didn't meet anyone else's eyes as he continued. They had dug out the bodies from the soil in an attempt to survive, but they had no water, so none did. A wave of nausea swept over me, so powerful I, f I feared I'd be sick. Anders swallowed hard before posing a valid question. So what does this mean? What's your punishment? He frowned at the small paper. Consume more air to stay alive? But the archaeologists didn't suffocate. They died from dehydration and being crushed. Graham opened his mouth to speak, but closed it, as though no words would come out. Instead, William spoke for him. The canopic jar, it's happy. 
the baboon-headed god. William stated this slowly as though with each word our understanding was meant to grow. I, however, was still lost. He sighed heavily and gazed at Graham with something like sympathy in his eyes. It's the jar that holds the lungs. The dark sludge that seeped out of the jars divide. The spongy bits that fell into the carpet, pieces of human lungs, whether they were Regis, Hannigan's, or Lucas's, I had no idea. That's horrible, Fawn said, she and Forrest both looking reproachfully back at the fireplace. I still don't get it, Anders said, shaking his head. I do, Wendy said suddenly. She exchanged glances with William and looked at Graham, who was now holding his hands to either of his temples as though trying to manually keep his body from trembling with fear. Graham's greed turned those college kids into cannibals, she said matter-of-factly. I blinked in surprise at her brashness, as though she wasn't wrong. The punishment fits the crime. Oh, shit, Andrew suddenly said, as though it had just hit him. And just like that, it came to me too. My head shot back towards the hearth, to the thick, dark paste that had coagulated on the brick. Consume more air to stay alive. Graham Willoughby would have to eat the lungs. Hey there once again, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or, you know, listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. This is the same thing I say at the end of every video all the time, so I think it kind of goes without saying that I appreciate you, and I appreciate you guys sticking around. We're moving into some of the hottest months of the year, which means that it's probably a good thing if some of you guys start to cool down a bit. A great way to do that, iced tea, sweet iced tea. You know, I'm from Texas is what we do. And my wife sells tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea to get a whole bunch of different kinds of teas, even creepy pasta based teas. And if you ask for the MCP dabbing sticker, you get a special one that nobody else gets. <laughs> and as always, I want to give a very huge thank you to all of my supporters out there on Patreon. I say this every time, but I truly mean it. You guys are the real MVPs. And without you, I don't think I would be able to continue doing this at the capacity that I do, especially not as many brand new custom stories as we've been getting just for the channel. So a very special thank you to Jacob Schaefer, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Ken Lando Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk 764, The Banana Mafia 1, Hollow Hero, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Katie Birch, Sashi Sazaku, Caden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Faya Lockett, Miss Xandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys once again so, so much. And if you would like to join this list of people's names that I mispronounce, or the list of people's names that are down there in the description, check out patreon.com slash Mr. Creepy Pasta. And as always, a very sweet dreams to all of you. Good night, folks. <laughs>